Welcome to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, episode number 30. Do the best you can and then relax. Let things go on in a natural way rather than forcing them. Paramahansa Yogananda. This is the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, where we teach you the top strategies, tactics, and grow hacks that every indie filmmaker needs to know to make money with their films. We are the podcast that puts the business back into show business. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Film Entrepreneur Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films, from predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them. The odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken, and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. So today on the show, we have film director, writer, actor, producer, Claudia Pickering. Now, Claudia is a Australian filmmaker that caught my eye when I read an article about her in the Huffington Post, how she was able to produce her first feature film, for under $5,000. And she came over to San Francisco, shot the whole thing out. And I was fascinated with her story of how she was able to do it on not only such a low budget, but I actually saw the trailer. I was like, wow, this looks really good. I was really impressed. And I wanted to uh, bring her on the show. I wanted to pick her brain on how she was able to do a $5,000 movie that has been distributed, has been released, uh, has been getting a lot of rave reviews over the course of the last six months or so, uh, not only in her home, country of Australia, but also here in the States. So get ready to take some notes because there's some nice knowledge bombs in this episode. So without any further ado, here is my conversation with Claudia Pickering. I'd like to welcome to the show Claudia Pickering, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, my dear. Absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate your hustle. And uh, and I heard about your movie Frisky and I had to have you on the show because uh, it's not very often that we see $5,000 films uh, do as well as yours. And also I wanted to get more female filmmakers on the show. And, uh, and that's why I reached out. So thanks for being on the show. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. So how did you get into this business? Oh goodness. Um, I was working as an architect actually. I I did all of my study, uh, undergrad and postgrad in architecture. Mm -hmm. And then, um, while I was doing my masters, had a bit of an epiphany that I, I used to sort of, you know, act and do all sorts of stuff when I was in high school and I that fell by the wayside when I got sort of sucked into the all-consuming world of architecture. And and so I took a step back and started – well, I didn't take a step back. I continued doing architecture and went and um, did a bit of acting stuff that then through that I met a bunch of um, friends and, and one friend in particular turned out to be a very close friend and uh, collaborator of mine. Mm-hmm. And we started making stuff. And one project led to another, and then I ended up with – I'd actually written and produced three – oh, produced three feature films, written and produced two, and written, produced, and direct, directed one. Nice. So, yeah, it's all happened over the last few years. They've all been super low budget, but, you know, they've all been relatively – good projects. So. Nice. So you're, you're definitely hustling without question. My pants off. I'll tell you what, not literally. Oh, sometimes <laughs> actually if you watch winning formula, which is the first feature we made, <laughs> my pants off. <laughs> <laughs> so how did Frisky come into being? Um, Frisky was just that thing where, you know, I'd finished making winning formula in LA and I moved up to San Francisco because I was like, Oh, I need to make money. Um, so I was working in architecture again and, um, yeah, I was having just a bit of a freak out, actually. <laughs> okay. um, 
just slowly being like, why did I move to America uh-huh. to not be working in architecture again? Like, I don't understand. Like, why did I make that leap? Why am I here mm-hmm. if I'm not working in film anymore? And, and I've got this thing going through post. Why am I sitting on my hands, like waiting for something to happen? So, yeah, I, and I'd been sort of writing down the different concepts for things that I was really like was like burning a hole in me to to tell the stories of. You know, mm-hmm. I had like amazingly fiery relationships with a couple of mates, and was just like, oh, this is the story I got to tell. And then I went and watched someone else's feature that they'd made for like twenty five grand mm-hmm. up in San Francisco. It was just like a little. It was a screening to sort of gauge the audience response before mm-hmm. he into festivals and I was like what did you make it on and he was like oh I shot it on a 7D and he like shipped all of his friends out to um, from California to Vermont to shoot the film Mm -hmm. and I was just like I loved that I thought it was hilarious I was totally drawn in by it I'm like I should be making a film like that and I'd also been collecting a bunch of music for and the for winning formula that was going through post in LA Mm -hmm. that was like it was like all these pieces were falling into place and like that was a thing that was weighing on my mind like this beautiful indie music that like didn't suit winning formula. I'm like, that's the sort of film that will actually express what kind of filmmaker I am Mm -hmm. and like my tone and my sense of humor and my sensibilities and all that kind of jazz. And, um, and so I was like, Oh, it was all like forming into this idea until that night when he was like, I shot it on a seven D and I was like, I've got a Canon six D I'm (laughs) my film. And I went, I went home and checked that I had enough savings to live, like for the next six months or whatever without working in architecture. Sure. And I, I did. Wow. And I had five grand left over to, to so, make. So, and, which is a pr- fairly psychotic um, way of going about things, which is fantastic. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but, um, but let me ask you, what made you think in your wildest dreams that you can make a feature film for five grand since you had never done something like that? Well, I mean, we made Winning Formula, like, we had, like, a full-on, like, beautiful crew, like, grip truck, the whole bit, mm-hmm. Winning Formula, and, and like, the production budget for that was only, like, 30 grand. Okay. And it was it, but, I mean, we had a grant from Panavision for it. Mm-hmm. It was, like, that was a full-on production, and I was, like, and I'd made a lot of sketches, like, sketch comedy stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, before that cost literally nothing to make. It's right. just like you get the right group of people together, you can just make stuff. Um, and if, as long as you don't want to sort of take all of the, if anything comes of it, you're the only one that gets It's like we did a profit share. So it's like, you know, I'm giving anything that that I get, everyone splits. So it's not like I'm this sort of Mogul. Uh, evil overlord who's like right. forcing people to do my bidding. Um, yeah, so there were... It, yeah, I was just like, this is totally possible. Not to mention, like, when I was writing it, I was like, I can do this for five grand because that guy did it for twenty five grand for one. Right. And I feel like I can make five grand stretch because I've been a cheap traveler for the last forever. But are also, you a tra- are you a travel hacker? <laughs> no, no, I'm just cheap. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and I. I I don't know. I just, that was my number. And that like with architecture, with anything, like you have a budget, you have to work within the budget, you make it work. Like mm-hmm. you figure out the things that you have to pay for and the things that you don't up front. And that's just, yeah, it's like, that's how I had been taught. So yeah, just, just, just jumped in, just jumped just in, jumped right in. So it was yeah. a calculated risk. I mean, you had a feeling that you could do something that, yeah. that you then- can make it work. I knew I had the play, like I didn't have to pay for any event, uh, what are they called? Not venues, um, location. Okay. okay. Sorry, I'm putting on this festival right now, so I'm like using festival words. Um, sure, sure. But no, it's, it, yeah. So I was like, so that, that's not going to cost anything. If I don't have to pay for cast and crew, that's not going to cost anything because they're all going to profit share. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, what does cost stuff? Food, food costs stuff. We'll have to rent gear, except like we've got most of the gear that we need. Mm hmm. We don't really, you know, you just go through the list and you go, yeah, I can, I can do this for no money. So it's amazing what you, when you start stripping down what you actually have to do, what you yeah. really need to make a movie, it, it's, you could do it. Again, it depends on the story you're telling. Yeah, that's true. And, and that is really, really a, a huge thing about this. It's like, this is a story where you're supposed to feel like you're there with the people. It's supposed to feel really personal. And really honest. Mm-hmm. And so, like, having something like, um, like, it totally suits being a completely shoulder-mounted 
um, DSLR gritty kind of thing because that's the kind of story it is. It'd be different if you're trying to shoot some really glossy sci-fi, mm-hmm. but um, that's not what I was trying to shoot. I was trying to shoot, yeah, this really sort of personal indie style thing that had really like indie music that went with it and all that jazz. So, Fair. so how did yeah. you? So how did you get all those like really cool locations around the city? <laughs> I just shot there. <laughs> I'm assuming you didn't permit then. Oh Christ! No, we had no permits. We just, um, I don't know. I'd kind of. San Francisco is kind of different to LA. Like you wouldn't try to do that in LA so much mm-hmm. um, because you'll for sure get a fine. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a bunch of like film school, uh, like IDs, actually a couple <laughs> of our, yeah. Yeah. From like leftover from like all our crew had like been in film school at some point sure, um, or like were currently in film school. Like we had a couple of sound people who were in film school. So mm-hmm. like if anybody was going to bust us, not that they ever really, we never really got into a position where we had to lie, mm-hmm. um, but yet, yeah, but we were ready to. Um, <laughs> of course. Yeah, they. We would have just been like, "Yeah, we're, sorry, it's a film school thing." And they'd be like, "Okay, move along." Right. <laughs> San Francisco, it's not an industry town like that, so people aren't like, "Oh, I can make money off this." Right. Um, I can make money off of making noise next to a film and them giving me hush money, or like you know, all those little tricky things people do in LA. Mm-hmm. Or, yeah, eight hundred bucks every time you're shooting in the street in LA. That's um, that's that's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, we couldn't have afforded that. You know, that's, a, that's just not something we could do. But yeah, San Francisco is just a different vibe, and and we worked with that. Although we did get the cops called on us. Did you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. When we, we were shooting the scene where it it's like outside, <laughs> my my character's got a guy from a party going down on her in the back of a car yes i saw that in the trailer yes it looks fantastic it's a very funny scene it's one of my favorite scenes uh-huh. and um it looked really suspicious like yeah. what we were doing. like it did like from the outside you can imagine how sus it would have looked they right. thought it was, it was shooting like an adult film and they're like we don't want that kind of activity in this neighborhood right and like they're like we've called the cops and we just peeled out of there so fast <laughs> Yeah, but look, it's easy to peel out quick when you've got like no proper – like you've got like one LED light that's like handheld that someone's holding and like, you know, there was nothing properly set up. So right. we were this little skeleton crew that was nimble as you like. It was great. That's why I'm assuming a, a good tip is when you're shooting something like this, you're shooting a $5,000 feature film, having a small footprint really helps a tremendous amount. Massively. Oh, God, it means you're so quick. Like it means like all of your time – like everything can move faster. Mm-hmm. It's not like, um, like for example, with Winning Formula, we had the grip truck and it was like, cool, well, everything's tripoded. So every time you move it, like you have to move an entire tripod or like everything's on, like there's like a track and we've got a full on dolly. Like, yeah, you get these beautiful dolly shots and stuff, which is great. And it's really suitable for that film, mm-hmm. but totally not suitable for Frisky. And, and, and like, we don't want to have to like move, you know how long it takes to move track. <laughs> Tracks, <laughs> Jesus. What a nightmare. So like that's the sort of stuff where it's like she's – there's Christiana with a DSLR on a shoulder mount and it's like, oh, I think we should, you know, change that shot up a little bit and she takes one step and like we're ready to roll, you know. And you could, and you have time to actually do what you want is create more create more footage and co- more coverage and let the actors play more so you have more as opposed to spending an hour moving a damn track. Yeah, which is all just it, – that's not the point. Like people – the whole point of like – I think the whole point of making a, a film, like for me, the point of making this one was to show what kind of stories I want to tell, not to show like my, what my like craft is all about in terms of, in terms, although that I'm really proud of the, the cinematography that mm-hmm. Christiana put together, un, particularly under those conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, but even if it wasn't in those conditions, I love the look of the film. Okay. Um, it wasn't about that. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't about like getting the glossiest shots and the most beautiful camera movement, and it being like a Coen Brothers film where it's like a one-er. Wow, um, that's that, that's that's nice, though. That's nice. <laughs> yeah, you've just got. Oh, it's so nice. I just did a thing like that. It was so great. <laughs> <laughs> but do so you've got to like be like, okay, what what do I have to give up? What's the main thing I want to get across with this film? This is going to be like a proof of concept for for me as a, as a director mm-hmm. and as a writer. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what are the core things that then need to get across? Right. And, and like, I don't need to have one as, and dolly shots to get that across. Like I just need to have bloody good performances, mm-hmm. a fun script and a really strong sense of story through it. And 
I, I think we've got that, and I think that's why it's been it's it's been doing well. Why people like it? I'm stoked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I feel you. I feel you. When you when you make a movie and people enjoy it, it's such a great feeling. Oh, so cool. <laughs> it's, now, can you tell people? Can you tell people a little bit about what the movie's about? Oh, I'll give you the logline. I'll just give you the, the fair enough. Line. It's about two friends that move to San Francisco to chase their careers, but they end up chasing tail instead. Fair and, enough. Yeah, it's just about this sort of like the, it's this really, really intense friendship that, that is very tumultuous and, you know, but it's all of those pressures under that, but also this this feeling of like wanting to find themselves and, you know, seeking attention and then, but, and then sort of essentially giving, like completely blowing their friendship, which was actually the thing that makes them who they are in the first place and then sort of coming back together after that. It's very much about sort of this strong, it's a real friend. It's about friend. It's about friendship rather than being about like sex, even though there's a bunch of sex in it. Sure. Um, yeah. That's, that's kind of, it's really just a friendship film. It's yeah. I'm really proud of it. Really awesome. Of it. And you shot it with the, the Canon 60, right? Shot it on the Canon 6D. Yeah, and now it's been optioned to be turned into a TV show in Australia, which is great. That's the best. It's amazing, actually. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to do that right now with our feature that I just finished. Uh, I'm like, hey, I would love to get it. It's a, it's, a, it's a great Netflix show or Hulu show or streaming show of some sort. Well, that's the thing. It's like once I thought I was actually – was just in at Netflix two days ago. Right. Which is not something I would have expected I would say. Like, ask me that six months ago, and I'd be like, what? I was having a mini at Netflix. Yeah. And, um, and they were just like, oi, like, it's so great that there's something like, for example, if I was to go in there and be pitching Frisky as the TV show, which we're putting together with Jungle in Australia, mm-hmm. it's like they're like, usually we would want to see a pilot or something like that, but the really nice thing about having a feature film as it's a proof of concept. So we get the tone, we see what it is, we understand what it's all about and like what the show will feel like. Mm-hmm. So it is actually money well spent in that regard because you do kind of, as long as you've got like a relatively character heavy film, um, you know, like you care more about the characters than you do about like the story. Well, you do want to have a good story too, but you know, mm-hmm. it, that have got strong characters that could then like play into a bigger thing. Like they, they really they want to see they want to see a pilot, but like it's yeah it's like it's ready to go like they're ready to see it it's already there like they've got the film that they've like the footage that they need it's to the, get them over the line so right you right really a pilot and a movie in one so basically what you're one of the things that I think a good business model of nowadays is instead of trying to shoot a pilot shoot a feature film that's based on a series that you're trying to do. And then you have at least a product that you can go out and sell while you're trying to pitch it. Yeah. And you can go around to fest. It'll get into, you know, festivals, even if they're little festivals, like we were only in little festivals and look at us. We had mm-hmm. mad, like I didn't even enter big festivals because mm-hmm. I was like, no way anyone's going to give a shit about this. <laughs> right. And, and, which now I kind of regret because I think maybe now, now with a bit of perspective, maybe I would have had a chance at one, you know, they have wild card people that come in there. Always, always. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I think it is actually a really sound thing to do rather than shooting just a pilot because a pilot's a hard thing to then get into a festival and get notoriety about and like mm-hmm. get distribution to like point to the future success of the concept it's it's actually just this really yeah it's this great thing because then you were, yeah you get best of both worlds. Now, um, what was your post production workflow like with that that whole thing? Did you just shoot one camera? Or shoot two? Um, the, only for the first two days or something we shot two cameras. Yeah, and then we were, we realized it just wasn't working. Like it just wasn't fast enough. It, we, it yeah, it was just not not a great way for us to work. And okay. so we got rid of our second camera. And just shot single cam, but I went through and um, did all of the like editor's assistant stuff and like because I'm like I want the people who are working for free for me to like not hate their job. I want them to do the bits that they want to do because they're coming on here really trusting me like to get this project done and for right. it to be something to enjoy. I want them to be doing the bit of their job that they like, you know, not the shitty bit. So right. excuse. me. Sure. And so they, um, yeah, so I did that and I like, you know, did all the data wrangling and synced all of the file, like the sound to the, mm-hmm. uh, and, and like organized all the files into, into like scenes and like da da da. So it was all really beautiful and neat. So that when Julie and the editor came in, 
it was just like, boom, he could just start the stuff that he's good at, you know, which is right. editing. <laughs> instead of being like, I hate this job. I've spent a week like doing editor's assistant, just garbage job, right. um, like trying to make stuff, which I've done a lot of. I shouldn't call it a garbage job, but it's hard. It like does your head in. Like, sure. You know, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, look, it's, 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 no one I don't think enjoys doing assistant editing like that. They all want to be the, they want, all want to edit. So. Yeah, it's it's hard. It's hard, and it's just like oh man, and sinking stuff. Oh my god. Anyway, um, yeah, did that. So that was then it. I passed it on to Julian. He would do drafts, and then I'd sort of come in, and we'd sit together for ages and just go nuts. And, and what you guys cut on? What's that? What did you edit on? Oh, on Premiere. Got it. Got it. And now, what was your distribution plan for the film? So I didn't really have one when we started because <laughs> I didn't know anything about it. But then I met um, – I was like literally once I had it done, I was like, okay, firstly, I guess we'll get – we'll do some festivals so that people have seen it and so there's some laurels. Sure. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I'll meet some people and I'll learn from some people in the at those festivals. You know, I can pick people's brains in that environment, which mm-hmm. is great. Mm-hmm. And, um, and was actually incredibly valuable doing that. Um and then what else happened? So then I was just like, okay, I guess I need to approach some distributors or something. I don't know. And I'm like sure. trying to trying to speak. I'm like trying to research like Distriba, you know. The, yep, I use them. Yeah, they're great. They look great. Um, and then I was like, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I was like just trying to see. Firstly, I was like looking in Australia and just trying to figure it out. And, sure. and I happened to meet – really very randomly like through like three different people got passed on and met this um this absolute legend named danielle and um she ended up coming on board she, like she you know graduated her masters of producing like the year before and um or maybe a couple of years before and was just and was working in a distribution company that's largely that largely does family films mm-hmm. full-on christian family films and she's just like nah this is not for us <laughs> Like, but you are like, I love this film and I want to make, I, I want to just, I want to sell it. Um, will you take a chance on me and be the first person, the first film that I have in my new company that I want to start? And mm-hmm. I'm like, yeah, man, you seem like a great person. And that's like pretty much what the success of the film has hinged on all the way up until now has been like just trusting people who just seem absolutely genuine and sure. about the project. Right. <laughs> really good vibes and so um yeah she took the project and then once I'd signed it over to her like a week later she's like oh I'm going over to the French Riviera to like Cannes for another film that I made um so I'll be there in a couple of weeks so I'll, so I'll like speak to people about the film there I'm like what you would have gone to Cannes with my film yes <laughs> so that was dope and she went over there and like we had a bunch of offers um on the film from that and um really that's yeah. awesome you know, which was cool. And, uh, and then, well, I mean, it was like, she met, she met a bunch of people. It went well. And then we had to like play the waiting game for a few weeks up the can because everybody's like completely swamped. Exhausted. Yeah, sure. In like watching stuff that they, the people that they met there. And, um, yeah, then we got a, we, I think we had like five offers or something. Mm-hmm. We ended up picking, picking Gravitas. Mm-hmm. So um, they offered us the world and we were like, cool, we'll start with um, the US and Canada. We wanted to do that release because it's a shot in America. It's technically like an Australian production because it was all like all the money and all of the, well, all the money. It's so funny. Sure. Um, but like all of that sort of stuff, like I was, I was working largely on it in Australia and mm-hmm. like, like in terms of like marketing it. And like I wrote it when I was back in Australia, it was like all this stuff that I and went over, shot it and then came back. Right. And, and, um, cause I was, on, I was moving countries back to Australia, um, three months after we shot, mm-hmm. which was also a really great deadline to have. Um, <laughs> yeah, cause we, we, we screened it for the, for the casting crew, like two nights before I was moving countries back to Australia. Um, just so that they knew that it existed. That was a really important thing to do too. They were just like, Oh, thank you. It's like the color wasn't done. The sound wasn't done, but they were like, cool. We see that it exists and you're not just like some fly by night idiot who just like didn't finish the thing you know sure. how oh yes i know um, i can't remember what my i sorry i got totally sidetracked i don't know what i was saying anyway <laughs> you were you were moving back and you're the final the final uh, the distribution oh distribution distribution um yeah so could have been doing it in 
we could have done an Australian release first. We were like, we think we're going to make more hype for our Australian release if we release it in America. Like it's going to be, okay, if we get a big Australian release and then release in America, America's not going to notice. Right. If we get a like reasonable US release and then release it in Australia, Australia will notice. Like mm-hmm. they'll notice because it's a film that's been released in the US. So mm-hmm. that was a very conscious decision we made to do it in that order. Mm-hmm. Um and and we did, and that's exactly what happened. Like the release in the US uh, went really smoothly. We had a, like a, at the last minute, we were offered to have a screening the night before the release at um, Australians in Film, which is where we're doing this festival on the weekend. Mm-hmm. And um, and they they screened it, and the Q and A went really well afterwards, and people were frothing. And then Peter, who runs Australians in Film here, like spoke to a whole bunch of other industry people about it and it just like absolutely blew up. Like it, nice. it was like ever happened to it and ended up like in the, in the paper in Australia. And then that turned into this, like suddenly we were able to get um, Madman, who is like a huge distributor, like, well not huge, but like one of the major distributors in Australia mm-hmm. who do like all the movies I like. Um, who I was like, I, I'm never going to have them distribute this film. Mm-hmm. And suddenly they're interested and suddenly we've got an option to have it, a TV show. And it's like, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. And, I had, and so you went in and pitched the TV show or did the, the TV show come to you? I like went in there. I went into Jungle having met with them like before they knew that Frisky existed, which is funny because it, it, it had been made like two years before my original meeting with them. And I was like, you know, because when you tell someone before a film's released and you tell them that you've made a movie for five grand, mm. they're like, yeah, good one. I'm sure it's great. Yeah, mistake number one, you never tell them what the budget is. Yeah, you know, and I was like, <laughs> oh, like, even if I didn't mention the budget to some people, because I think I saw people's faces drop when I said it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I made a movie and it's going to get released next year. And they're like, yeah, sure thing. Never heard of it. Shut up. Get out. <laughs> right, right. Um, but... Uh, yeah. So I went in there having already had a meeting and they're like, what? Well, yeah, whatever. It wasn't, it was just like kind of a whatever meeting. It was fine. It was, Mm -hmm. it went fine, but it was like, cool, you know, maybe see you around at the end of it. And then, um, and then when Frisky came out, they were like, oh, that stuff you said was true. Like the film is real and, and we want to see, like, obviously people are liking it. So what else have you got? And so it was that where I walked in there and I was like, okay, well, these are all the things I've been working on, like developing for the past couple of years since Frisky. And they're like, well, what about Frisky, the TV show? And I'm like, what do you mean Frisky, the TV show? <laughs> <laughs> but now it's like, I'll never think any other way. It's like every feature I'm writing, I'm like thinking of it as a potential like TV version. Like, sure. Yeah. So that. that's, I think the future, I honestly think that's the future for indie films as well, because if you can prove, of the concept in a feature film, yeah. it's just so much easier for Netflix or Hulu or Amazon or or any any streaming service to produce a low a low budget version of that for like eight episodes or a few seasons of of that. It makes just the most sense in the world. It, it honestly does, and they love it. They love a proof of concept. They're like, thank you for make going out and making that. You know? Right. And that you actually have a product at the end of it, not just like a short film or a trailer. You actually yep. have something that you can go out and sell. Yep. Sure do. Now, what's the hardest part of making Frisky? The hardest part of making Frisky was, God, I don't know. It was like so great. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best time. I, um, did, I said the same thing. Anyone asked me the same question about my movie. I'm like, that was just awesome. I just had a great time. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. I loved writing it. I loved casting it. I loved, I even loved people. I mean, probably the hardest part was trying to make the schedule really good so Mm -hmm. that everyone was happy with it because I didn't want to be putting anyone out because they were all coming and doing it for free. And what was the, what was the, how many days did you shoot? Um, it was like over 14 days. Okay. Like, Like it was over a 14 day period, but within that there were days off. Sure. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't know, something. (laughs) <laughs> Some, somewhere inside that 14 day thing a movie and, um, was made <laughs> it was pretty quick uh, yeah and I guess honestly the hardest thing for me apart, I mean scheduling does you does you noodle a bit but it's like it's kind of satisfying when you get it done and right yes um, until someone really needs to go and watch the Ohio State 
um, national championships. Uh, <laughs> like when it, like while you're shooting, you're like, "What do you mean, Brandon Wardle?" Um, he's like, "My team is finally in the national championships. You've got to change the schedule." I'm like, ah, "Okay, okay, I'm gonna do it for you, man." That's cool. Wow, but that's the thing you deal with. That's what you yeah, deal with. Yeah, you Did you like? Oh, you're too much of a legend for me to not like make this work for you. Sure. Um, and he gave so much to that film anyway. Anyway, so um, that was the hardest part. Was the schedule? Deliverables. Deliverables. At oh, the- yeah. oh my god! And you know why it was the hardest? It's because I didn't <laughs> know about them before. Deliverables like, probably cost more than the movie itself. If I had known about Deliverables, sure. the distribution companies, I would have been like, have been so ahead of the game. Sure, you know, I would have. You, knew, you know, you want to have nice. You want to have like your little marketing package. You want to make sure you've got your little bloody. You know, oh, what are they called? Like DVD extras and shit that you get when you're on set. Like we didn't get any of that. Um, just would have been nice. But, sure. you know, that sort of stuff, um, fortunately because I've got my a background in architecture and I I'm, I'm, have worked as a graphic designer as well, like from that, um, it's, it's like doing things like putting together all the pretty print stuff, like your nice – posters and all that kind of jazz and like a, my mate up the street's a really good photographer so mm. he shot the uh, the what's it called the <laughs> poster sure um uh, yeah so like again it was still being a little scrappy bastard to try and get it all all together but that sort of stuff is is actually really simple for me because mm. i can i can uh, use all the graphic stuff i'm i'm the adobe suite like Post a girl. Sure, sure, sure. Now, as far as the deliverables are concerned, uh, did you master everything, I'm assuming, in 1080 or did you do 4K? What did you master oh, in? 1080, 1080. 1080, right? So, and you output and all your deliverables for everything was pretty much 1080. Yep. And that's what I try to tell everybody so much. Like, dude, don't worry what about 4K. About 4K? Why huh? is this session with 4K? No one cares about 4K at this point in time. Like, because no one can watch it. <laughs> It's it's, like, it's, all they need to shoot to like put this thing to uh, you know project in a massive cinema is is 1080. 1080 like, or 2K and 2K is just a little bit bigger than 1080. Yeah, yeah it's only slightly bigger. Yeah. Um, yeah, totally chill with 1080. Like I haven't ever had any kind of trouble with that. Like the only reason why I would shoot in 4K is if I didn't have a DP who was who was like like on point enough and I wanted to be, and I was like, Oh, I'm, oh, I'm going to have to crop in on this stuff all the a time. A reframe, a reframe of constantly. Right. Yeah. Like if that's, that's the only reason why at this point in time with all the other technology having not caught up yet. Uh-huh. Um, why? And God, can you imagine the data? Oh, kill me. Oh yeah. I, I know. I know. I know. I, I, yeah, it's a beast. It, it's a beast. I did my movie at 2.5 K, but I shot raw. Oh yeah. my God. God. It was about seven terabytes when we were, and we shot two cameras, so seven terabytes when we were done. Well, at least that's something like in the future. I would love to. Well, I mean, from I have been now, but like it is like when you're doing color correction on DSLR footage, Ooh. Like, it's it's tough. Ooh. It's like, fine. Yeah. <laughs> you better have a good DP. It's I've gonna ma- be. Good. It's gonna be kind of gritty, and sh- yeah, I mean. She shot it as flat as she could. Yeah, sure. Um, but it's like still you you up against it. But it's like, do you know what? It's a DSLR film. <laughs> like, sure. Still, like Just, it's not going to look like you shot it on an Ari Alexa. Right. Except that. <laughs> accept it and move on, and just move on, and you know, accept what you are. If yeah, there's a lot of acceptance that needs to happen, but and focus on the stuff that you need to excel at. Now, what was the biggest mistake you made while making the film? Oh, I think not knowing about deliverables. <laughs> deliverables again. <laughs> they haunt me. They haunt me forever. All right. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, deliverables. Yeah. My nightmare. Yeah, I, I, I've been in post for over almost twenty years, so deliverables don't scare me as much. But I can see if you are not prepared for it, it oh. could hit you like a ton of bricks. Yeah, and you will never not be prepared again. Yes. Oh no, absolutely. You'll always know. Like, no, okay, I need. Yeah. I need to have my digital deliverables. I need to have my HDSR. I need to have possibly a DCP and, and so on. Oh, shebang. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and it's inexpensive too, man. They are expensive. Um, now, what um, – I'm going to ask you the same questions I ask all of my guests. So there's a group of questions I ask. So prepare yourself. Yep. These are very, very heavy questions. 
Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker just wanted to break into the business? Make a bunch of stuff. Amen, <laughs> a- amen sister. Because <laughs> that, 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 like, you're only going to, you know, I met, I've met a bunch of people who are like, oh, I've got like a stack of scripts and I want to make one of them and it's going to, but I've just got to wait until it's the right time, until it's perfect and all this kind of shit. I'm like, but you're not even a filmmaker yet. You haven't made anything. Like right. how are you going to? How, how are you going to do the best service to that script that you love mm-hmm. if you haven't bloody practiced? Like, you've got to practice. Like, I didn't just go and make Frisky and be like, oh, I want to make a movie and then just make a movie. It was like, yo, I'm going to make a whole bunch of, like, shorts and, like, online content and, like, really, really silly <laughs> comedy sketches mm-hmm. and I'm going to learn how to do it and – and then, and then embark on doing something bigger. And yeah, I, sure, I did it pretty quickly, but it's like I've really, really, really made a lot of stuff before um, embarking on it because you, there's just shit you don't know about, like that you can't know about without having like silly little quirks that you can't read about and then understand the actual ramifications of <laughs> right. until it happens to you. Um, so, yeah, I just think it's all about making stuff and then once you've got your head around it. And like also – that script that's the best script on your pile, yeah. like you don't know how that translates to screen until you've made one. So like make the best script on your pile and you'll realize how to make a better script and the other five scripts on that pile you won't want to make once you've made the best script on the pile. <laughs> like, right. First, right? And then you'll get better and just move forward. Just constantly, constantly be trying to make stuff. That's all. And build your, like your network of mates who you'll make stuff for, like be giving, you know, because people are going to be giving to you. Like you gotta, you gotta give back and like, cool. Do you need a hand on your set? Like let's help each other. Like I've got a mate who actually, we just did some um, improv together and she was like, Hey, I heard you made a film. This was like a couple of years ago. It was like six months after we made Frisky. She's like, I've stalked you on the internet and I, saw that you made a movie. I want to make a movie. Well, can I buy you lunch and pick your brain? I'm like, absolutely. I'd lo- I love getting bought lunch. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Cause I can set a bit cheap like that. Uh-huh. And, um, she bought me lunch and then I ended up producing her film, like for no money. <laughs> like I didn't get paid to do it, but I was like, man, I'm going to come and help you on this because other people rocked up and helped me. And I, I've got a lot to give for this for nice. you. And, like, you know, but like spread the love, you know, like, um, it's not like I'm the first person to have ever done that. Like I had a whole crew of people doing that for me when I when I was doing it. Isn't it so. isn't it true though? Like a lot of filmmakers have the mentality sometimes of like competition and I can't give away the secret sauce. I'm like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> like you've got to give, you've got to help each other. It's all about it's all about the team thing. And I mean, look at you. You just have to look at what happens in Hollywood. It's like people form these alliances. Like look at all of the guys like who like like your James Franco crew. Sure. Like, all help each other make their dreams <laughs> become a reality. Like they do. They all hook each other up and like, yeah, I'll be in your thing and you be in my thing and we'll we'll make stuff and we'll make all the stuff that we want. And and like every, every project that we work on, even though it may not have your name as a film by, mm-hmm. it's like you're still in it and it's still a credit to your name and you still learn from it. And, God, just being on set, you learn so much. Like last year I'd never been on set for a TV show So I was like, rather than being an arrogant dickhead and being like, oh, but I'm a director, like I shouldn't be doing anything less than directing, I was like, I'm going to be a third AD in this little slot that I can fill for an Australian, like, government-funded TV show. Sure. I can see what the hell a set looks like and how they function because I want to get involved in that stuff. And it's Mm -hmm. like, I didn't get paid for that. (laughs) Right. But you've just got to do stuff because you need to, or else you'll blow it. Like you need to have some experience. You need experience. Anyway, God, I just had the hugest rant. I apologize. It's all, it's all good. It's all good stuff. It's all good stuff. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? What, what book? Yes. Oh my God. Save the cat all day. (laughs) Yes. Blake. All day. Blake Snyder be my like just guiding star. Um, because like once you know the formula, you can break it, Mm -hmm. but you know the formula. So it's not a total pile of shit. That's the thing. Like I had, um, like people who watched the film, they were like, Oh, and like, who was, it was like the, who was the president of the Australian directors guild who really enjoyed it. She was lovely. We did a Q and a together, um, after training in Sydney and she was like, yeah. And like, 
you know, like structurally the film's really sound and this and that. And I'm like, oh, that was Blake Snyder. <laughs> that was a beach. <laughs> um, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, no, structure is so important. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of, I'm a big fan of structure because yeah. it's, it's, it's not like it's become formulaic. It's like, look, this is a structure. Now you can, now you can dress that structure however you want. It's the frame of a house, but totally. each room's going to be different, but you need that frame and that foundation. Yeah. So that people can feel stuff, you know? Exactly. Now, what's the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Lesson that took me the longest to learn. Oh my god! And it's deep. It's deep. I told that you. Was so there's so many. God, something that was really hard for me um, was leaving being a being a blonde girl. Yeah. <laughs> and leaving architecture, where you can say to people, I'm an architect or like I'm a architectural designer. I work in architecture. Sure, sure. They're suddenly like, oh, man, your heat's clever and you're this and that. They're like, you know, they're like, right. oh, I thought you looked like an idiot because you're a blonde chick. But you, oh, and like I suddenly have this credibility and like there's a whole lot of ego that comes with that. Sure, <laughs> of course. And really satisfying to be able to do that. And, yeah, so being like transitioning over to – to saying I work in comedy and not telling people that I'm <laughs> working in architecture was a really, really tough thing for me to learn how to do. Sure. Because um, I was almost embarrassed to not be, uh, like to let go of a profession that I'd worked so hard to make. Right. But then like the further I've gotten into this, I'm like, oh, I'm actually I'm good at this and I'm I'm equally as successful as I was mm-hmm. working in architecture. And you're having as, fun. And I'm having fun. This is the life I want to live, man. Yes. And, and like people do respect, yeah, there's like a huge gap there where like starting from scratch after you've built something else up, like people think you're an idiot for doing it and sure. they um, they treat you like one. They sure. talk to you like you've done something really stupid and frivolous and um, and you know that you're working hard but it doesn't look like it to them. doesn't matter. All right. Those pretty sketches you're putting online, that's your job now. I'm like, I'm working in a taco shop to fund that shit. Right. Um, and, and yeah, so ego-wise it was really hard and and like like trying to convince my family like I've made a good decision was <laughs> extremely hard actually. Yeah. Brutal. That must have been brutal, that conversation. So brutal. Yeah, cause especially when they're like, oh, cool, she's going to be fine. She's got a good job in architecture. She'll be great. Um, and I'm like, actually, I'm going to move to America. I'm going to make comedy. Um, yeah, didn't go down well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great now, though. I've like I've proven myself, and that's great. But you do. It's that. It's like putting your ego aside, um, and also then having to prove yourself, and all of the naysaying that goes on. That's and it's not com- like for me, it wasn't a huge amount of naysaying, but it was like this really. It was a sense of disappointment from my family that they weren't deliberately trying to give me, but it was quite apparent right. that was an artist. So that was a very difficult thing to get through. But I just learned that, you know, if you do something that you care about, you're going to do a good job of it. Mm-hmm. So that was a huge lesson learned. Okay, very good. Now, what um, what are three of your favorite films of all time? Oh, my God. The toughest question on the list. Oh, how do I – Pick? Are you kidding me? Just three, just three that come to your mind today at this moment in time. Oh God! It won't okay. be on your gravestone. Don't worry. Just pick three I'm that you think of. I'm completely drawing a blank. Oh, the castle, obviously. Oh, okay. Do you know the castle? No, yeah, no, I don't know that film. The castle is an Australian film from the '90s that is one of the best films of all time. Okay, <laughs> I will, we will look it up. Um, the castle. Uh, so that would be number one. I'm a huge fan of Baz Luhrmann. I'm just going to list Australian films. Sure, by sure. It's, it's all good. Baz Luhrmann's awesome. <laughs> Pretty much anything Baz Luhrmann, huge fan of, except maybe Australia, which is funny because whatever. But uh, yeah, that's that was yeah. Love him, love him, love him. Um, oh God, and like oh, I don't want to say it, but like Pulp Fiction. That's all, no. why, why not say it? That movie's amazing. <laughs> Says that though, but it's like such a shit hot. You know, oddly, oddly enough, not a lot of people say that movie on the show. Believe it or well, not, it's only come up a few thinking, times. They're all thinking it. Actually, I pulled the the structure apart on Pulp Fiction, and it actually wasn't as impressive as I thought it was. But I'm like, man, I'm so drawn into those characters. You don't even realize how like blah some of the storylines are. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, oh, that kind of amounts to nothing. But it's a bit of character development. That's awesome. 
Yes, it is. Now, where can people find you online? Me, personally. You, the movie, anything, yeah. Um, uh, the movies, uh, it's all over the place. It's like, you know, on iTunes and all the places you can find things. Okay. Um, Any social media accounts? Social media, there's uh, Frisky Movie. Okay. Fris- at Frisky Movie, anything, or friskymovie.com, you can find all the ways to, to download the film. Okay. And me, personally, I'm... My handle is the Dark Lord because it's a Harry Potter reference because I love Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> it's T H E D A R C L A U D. Okay, very good. Dark Lord in Australia, but if you Americans say it's all wrong, doesn't make sense. The joke doesn't make sense. Um, yeah, that's so, me. So, Claudia, thank you so much. I absolutely love your energy and your enthusiasm to what you're doing in your work, and uh, I hope it rubs off on on the tribe listening today because uh, you oh. could tell that you're just having a good time. And isn't that why we got into this business in the first place? That's precisely why we got into it. I got into it to stop like drawing CAD lines for rich people's houses. <laughs> <laughs> Claire, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Claudia really is a wonderful filmmaker and I'm so happy that she's getting all the success that she is. So Claudia, thank you so much for being on the show and sharing those knowledge bombs with the tribe. If you want to get links to anything we talked about in this episode, head over to the show notes at filmtrepreneur.com forward slash zero three zero. And if you haven't already, please head over to filmbizpodcast.com and leave a good review for the show. It really helps us out a lot. Thank you again so much for all your support, guys. As always, the power is in your hands. Be a film entrepreneur. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Filmtrepreneur podcast at filmtrepreneur.com. 